Good morning, everybody. I am Jess Hampton and I head up the utilities team at One Spatial. I've got the great honour today to welcome you to the next webinar in the Esri UK and One Spatial series focused on utility network. Uh, we've got a insightful and intriguing session ahead for you and I can say that with confidence having seen a preview of the presentation today. So um, I'm going to be very shortly handing over to Liam Kelly who is the head of the DICE team at Northern Gas Networks and I'll let Liam explain a little bit more about DICE as part of his presentation uh, but he's going to be sharing with you about the experience that Northern Gas Networks have had so far and taking the plunge towards utility network. So that will cover everything from the initial business case, the procurement process, and also an update on how the project is going. Once Liam has, has helpfully talked us through where, where NGN are up to on their journey, uh, we will then have a panel session. And in that panel session, I will be your MC, and I will be joined by Craig Hayes, who is the head of CNI at Esri UK, and Phil Francis, who is the utility network lead for One Spatial. Um, in order to get the panel session going, it would be very grateful if you can answer, enter any questions that you've got into the question box, um, which should be in the panel in front of you. Um, and we will we will address those as we go through and they can range from anything to do with Liam's presentation to any sort of burning questions you've got about utility network more generally and we will get through as many of those as possible towards the end of the session. Um, so without further ado it is my great pleasure to introduce Liam Kelly. Good morning everybody. Um, firstly I'd just like to thank one spatial and Edgerick obviously for inviting us along today to discuss and share our experience so far in implementing the UN model um, at NGN. Um, as Jess said, I'm Liam, I'm the head of the Data and Information Centre of Excellence. And before I start, I just want to spend a, a few minutes, if that's okay, just giving you a bit of a brief overview on who NGN are, in case you don't know who I am, and obviously the, the business drivers within NGN for implementing the, the UN model. So NGN, we are a gas distribution business based up in the, the north of England. So we own and maintain around 37 kilometres of the gas pipes and the um, associated equipment. Um, and we deliver gas to about 6.7 million individuals, which relates to about 2.7 million endpoints on our network. And we cover areas from the, the middle of nowhere in rural areas and obviously into the big cities such as Newcastle, Leeds, York, etc. So the Data and Information Centre of Excellence within NGN was actually set up um, and created in 2019 just off the back of our SAP S4 implementation and the fundamental aim was to improve the maturity of data management within NGN and then look at expanding our capabilities around data science location master data management and for us, this has been a really useful ex exercise for a lot of different reasons, including projects. So a lot of our work is around supporting NGN's digitalization strategy and action plan. And this is now a licensed condition in our GD2 cost reporting period with our regulator Ofgem. And it's all around the digitalization of NGN. How can we use technology and data to help the UK meet its, its climate change challenges? how can we then maximize the value of data and make data visible both internally and externally as well and we're doing a lot of work to support the development of the national energy systems map and all that ultimately is embedded on good data management practice so as a team we, we've developed our data management strategy we are about a year and a half into our data governance program which is really now starting to pay dividends especially when it comes to stuff like data quality and one of the areas we have developed is data science and analytics and that has played a key part really in our ability to both understand our data analyze our data as we look to move to a un model so to do that we kind of look at a three systems approach the first one is kind of the system of record and this is kind of where we we have been as a business for the past two years embedding as i say good data governance practice good data quality practice within the organization 
and as, as I mentioned before, we're kind of then developing this kind of system of analytics and also then this system of engagement. And we're kind of turning as a team now where the system of record bit will continue to develop and continue to mature. But we're putting a lot of focus within the organization around analytics and engagement. How do people engage with data? How do people understand data? I think the past year of all our lives has been changed significantly. And one of the things that's come out of it is our understanding of what does good data management look like? You know, when we've all now become used to looking at charts on the news and understanding the definition of different things. And this is no different in, in, in organizations. So a move to the UN model helps us do this for a few different reasons. When it comes to analytics, it will help us to develop this kind of digital twin using the capability of IoT devices. And that is something obviously we're really passionate about. And it allows us to do spatial and analytics as well. Everything happens somewhere. And as much as SAP and Microsoft 365 and them tools are absolutely fantastic, people want to engage with data nowadays in a totally different way. And it's about bringing the data to life to allow people to drive business decisions, become more efficient. And, and the other thing we're looking at doing as well in this engagement is developing a suite of apps so as people begin to look at data, can we bring in different data sets? Could it be customer data? Could it be work up data about previous work? Just do it, give us that better customer experience within NGN. So a little bit of background when it comes to GIS um, in NGN. So that thing on the left is, isn't a ball of elastic bands. That is actually our conceptual data model. It is current place when it comes to GIS. And like, I guess, a lot of utilities, um, NGN utilizes GIS products, both to map and view the assets on our network. And our current GIS system is primarily based on version, the Esri version 9.3.1. And we've had this version for a long time, and it's kind of been under this kind of advanced custom maintenance since around 2013. And with that, we've kind of got everything from desktop applications, web applications, and mobile applications. And over the past few years, we've had to do several projects really to kind of build these mobile applications and these web applications to meet the business requirements. And where we've kind of ended up is we've got this new technology built on top of old technology, and that comes with complexities in itself. And this has kind of led to our GIS landscape get into a kind of an undivided state and it contains a mixture of applications a mixture of versions a mixture of vendors and it becomes really really complicated to keep on top of it to implement change where change is required so this requires also replication every night between these different systems to ensure they all keep synced up and like any kind of replication, sometimes it doesn't work. And in our case, that happens more often than we'd like. And that becomes the problem, both from a data quality perspective, from a workload perspective, and also from a, a user experience. So what we want to try and do is bring everything up to the current version. And that's kind of the background of why we are implementing UN in NGN. I don't think we'll be the only business with these challenges. I think a lot of utilities might be in a similar place. And that was a, that was definitely the case for us so that's kind of the background so in terms of the presentation as Jeff mentioned I've kind of broke it down into four areas really just to talk through our experience around building the business case what our project scope was and how we broke it up the kind of procurement approach we had to go through and then just give you a bit of an update in terms of where we are on on the project at the moment and I really hope you find some helpful insight um, if, if you are where we are now or where we were six months ago in terms of thinking about doing the AUN implementation, perhaps you can relate to our experiences as well. And maybe actually you've had these experiences and overcoming and I'd be really um, keen to, to learn more about your experiences as well. And if anything, just really enjoy learning about our, our experience over the past six months. I'm going to try and use um, um, emotions to try and describe kind of the different phases we went through just to try and show you what worked well what didn't work well and what we wish we'd have done better so the first one was around how was the business case built and who did we engage internally 
well to be honest with you just based off everything i've just mentioned to you it was kind of technically led this was our infrastructure team telling us we needed to do something different the technology was no longer fit for purpose it was causing a lot of issues from a reliability availability and a cost perspective and we had to do something different so it kind of came from a technical side now as much as it went well and the business case stacked up even just on a technical bit i really wish we'd have engaged the business users a lot earlier in that business case because the benefits were all technical and what we've learned I guess since we've started the project is as we started then engaging with the end users some really great ideas are coming out you know one of the things that has come out is from an individual from ngn saying well i want to be able to put customer complaint data in there i want to be able to put reinstatement data in there workload data in there doing material takeoff within this kind of gis system or the or the engagement system and it's like if we'd have known that we could have built that into the business case however i must admit we have been quite lucky the project is going quite well and a lot of these kind of requirements we we have been able to get into the project and i'll tell you a bit more about that later on but i guess if i were to do this again i'll probably look at it from a technical perspective and a business perspective as well the other thing we did um, which was really useful um, because of our how complex our system is and because it's been built over years and years and people have come and, and gone from the business we actually engaged an external party just to do with a bit of an assessment of where are we currently, what are all these different versions we've got, what licenses have we got, who's using what for what. And that was really, really good. It kind of gives us from a technical perspective where we are. And that's something I would really recommend if you found yourself in a similar situation to us. It did come with a bit of problems towards the back end where it created a little bit of confusion, especially around the future direction. It was a great piece of work for the Azid, but there were some assumptions in there around the future direction, especially around mobile applications that didn't entirely fit with where we were going as a business strategically. And I think internally that did cause a little bit of confusion. But apart from that, it was actually a really fantastic piece of work. And then in terms of after we'd done all that, we went through a bit of a process internally of just both engaging and educating people especially our senior managers our in investment steering group who obviously ultimately would be signing off the business case just to explain to them not what we're doing from not just what we're doing from a technical perspective but what does this mean for the bigger picture what does this mean for the direction of travel for a, the business and what benefit does going to a un model bring to mgn and that was a not a long drawn out process but that took a lot of time because we were both educating ourselves within the team on UN and then obviously we had to educate um, different people as well but that that worked well it was beneficial because when we did get to that point of taking it to the um, investment saving group most people became accustomed to what it is we were trying to do so in terms of the scope of the project um, in terms of how was it defined and the, the benefits so we brought the project down into three different lots Lot number one was around the UN design and the data migration. Lot two was around the architecture. And lot three was around the integration to SAP S4 HANA. So lot number one, as I say, was all around that kind of data design for the UN model. And before we began, and I'll be totally honest, that was a bit that really concerned me. How could we get from where we are now to where we want to go and be able to migrate the data and the data quality issues we might have? But to be totally honest with you, it's been a really, really enjoyable piece of work and not as frightening as what I first thought. I think for us, the key benefit was working with people like One Spatial and Ezra. And I'm not just saying that because it's their call. It has been really well thought out and a really great piece of work. Some of the colleagues on the, the technical project team are working fantastic across One Spatial, Ezra and NGN. And we're kind of going through this process of kind of doing a data assessment on where we are looking at what a un design may look like in ngn and then kind of doing the looking at the configuration of the un and i've been really encouraged by the the progress we have made so far and in terms of how we've done this you know we're all working in different ways um ideally we'd all be in a room and we'd be doing this, these types of workshops but we've not been able to 
So one special and Edgley, to be fair, took the lead and kind of designing these virtual workshops. And what's been really different about this piece of work relative to other projects I've worked on has been that then workshops, we, we go into it with a clear objective. We are talking today about distribution pipes. And this is a reason why we're talking about it. And this is where you currently are. This is where we want to go to in the UN model. And these are the things we have to consider based on the UN model and based on where you currently are. And then we have a really good couple of hours conversations, looking at the data, looking at the options. But what's been different here is both on Edry and One Spatial of making recommendations. We recommend you should do this because of this. And that's been really key, to be honest with you, because that's really made it a lot easier for us to be able to digest the information and get an insight into how the UN's going to work. And we are in a good place on the project. I'll explain that a bit later on. And for me personally, that is the single reason why. Now we've done all that, we're kind of now going through the process of prioritizing really what is going to be migrated over. We've kind of got the non negotiables as a business. This data is so important to us, we cannot go live without this data. And we understand what the non negotiables are. And to be honest with you, when we started the project, if we'd have gone live with just the non negotiables, that would have been enough for us as a business. And then we can build on top of that. But because of how the workshops have gone, because of the experience of the technical teams, We've actually now started to look at the priority ones. We can get some of that stuff over. We're probably going to get some of the priority two data sets into the UN model as well, which is far more than we ever imagined. So we're just working through that now, looking at the volume of data, looking at the quality of data, and looking, obviously, how we're going to migrate the data. And that's been really, really beneficial. So where we are now, we have a UN model for NGN. It looks absolutely beautiful. It doesn't look like a ball of elastic band. It's clear. It's simple. But it's so much it's so much power inside it, not just in terms of now, but in terms of what we can do in the future. You know, as, a, as gas networks in the UK, we're looking at hydrogen. Our UN model is hydrogen ready, not just if we convert to hydrogen, but also to allow us to potentially track the work as it's happening through the UN model, which is, you know, again, we didn't start out the project with that as a, a deliverable, but to end up in that position is really, really good. So for me, I'm blowing a party streamer, quite happy where we're at, but equally, you know, I've done projects like this before. Fingers crossed that this kind of positive kind of start with we have continued. On the architecture, now I'm not an ex expert when it comes to architecture, so I will keep this quite um, high level. This is, I guess, an area that has caused us probably the most issues so far. And that's more just due to kind of the understanding of definitions of things I don't understand, kind of capacity constraints, and also just getting the timing of things right. I think in hindsight, we probably thought the design of the UN model and the data profiling and assessment would have took a lot longer than it actually has. So we didn't plan to kick off the architecture work we, we kicked off at the same time as the UN work, thinking the architecture would be done because the UN work would take a lot longer, where in fact, we've kind of got to a point now where we are ready to do a data migration and we're still spinning up the architecture, which is fine. It's the process you go through. But I guess for me, a big key takeaway is if you can get the architecture built quicker and earlier than, than in your plan, I suggest you do it because that would have been really helpful for us. But I think to be fair, you know, we are far off and we are getting ready to do the data migration. We have been helped that we have been able to use some of the one, one spatial environments. So it hasn't really held us up. Uh, we, we could have probably gone a little bit earlier though with the data migration if it were ready. The next bit is kind of the SAP integration and that's me there praying. <laughs> I say praying in a kind of a bit of a joke, but we're somewhere off, we're, we are some way off doing this. But we are engaging with the, the the partners on that, and they're a part of the conversations around the UN. I think for me personally, this is probably now the biggest risk area, and I don't mean risking that it's impossible. I mean it's just out of everything. This is the one where we know we need to put a lot of focus on. I think the quality of data, because obviously we're going to be pulling data directly from S4, will be not an issue, but something we'll have to work over. We also then need to look at kind of the configuration and the end user capability as well. 
So that's kind of the area we're going to next, but we'll get there. I know we will, but I think for me, that's the area, obviously, that's probably going to cause us the, the most concern. However, from a risk mitigation perspective, we're actually going to run both systems at the same time towards go live. And again, you know, this the extra cost with that, obviously, but I think from a risk perspective from our business, it's the right decision to make. So we will go live with the UN model integrated to SAP, but we will also have our, our current GIS version integrated to, to SAP through all them horrible uh, interfaces. And we will run them in parallel for a few different reasons. One, we want to ensure it works and the integration works, which is key. Two, we want to ensure that the quality of data can be maintained and improved in the UN model, which we believe it will be. And we're under no illusions as we go through this process. There's always somebody who does something that we might not be aware of yet. And we want to ensure that when they move over to the, the new system, they can continue to do their day job. You always, you always get them edge cases. And I don't think you can ever delay a go live because of edge cases, but it's important to understand what they are. And the best way of kind of draining them out is just turn the system on and just see if people can work. So we, we are going to run both systems in parallel. And for us, that's kind of a risk mitigation. And for me personally, I think it's definitely a, a, a better way of doing it. In terms of the one of the key principles is around the kind of the cops principles. For us, that's really important. We did we did that with S4 and that is paying it paid dividends straight away and it paying, it continues to pay dividends. I think for me, you know, you get that functionality into the hands of users a lot quicker. And also the access to the data migration tools becomes a lot kind of simpler. But for me, I think the important bit by keeping to COP is it's easy to maintain and it allows us to kind of embed future capabilities that come online within our business a lot easier. We've just done a SAP S4 upgrade. It, after doing the implementation and as much as obviously we're out for the people in, involved in it it actually wasn't that difficult relative to previous upgrades where we had ended up with an over configured system so for me in terms of the business case perspective that gives you a better return on investment easier to maintain easier to upgrade in the future and you get access to these different capabilities that are going to come online and in terms of the benefits to ngm um, these are a lot of benefits, you know, you only have to read a one spatial article or an Edgery article, but rather than repeat what them guys have said, I thought I'd kind of say, well, what are the actual benefits to NGM? So I think, firstly, and I'll always begin at the data, the data model is far simpler. It's far simpler to understand, it's far simpler to, I guess, educate people on. And when we start looking at where we're going as a business by developing apps, bringing in different data sets from the out, the outside and also sharing NGN data sets, being able to explain to people the data, the metadata has become far easier now we're implementing the UN model. I think as well, data quality will significantly improve after this implementation. As part of kind of the work we've been doing so far, we've been able to define these the, these rules to help us to maintain the integrity of the data within the UN model. One of the other things it will do is kind of this digital footprint on changes. You know, as, as a business, we get asked questions about our assets all the time. And I, anybody who works in this kind of industry will know you're sometimes going through a piece meal of bringing together information from different, different systems to understand what changes have been made, where actually with the digital fingerprint, as they call it, within UN, we can literally say, tell me what the network looks like on this, look like on this date. And we can bring that out. And I think for us, that will be a great, um, from a data quality perspective and also from an efficiency um, perspective as well. What it will also help us do, and I don't think we'll get to here when we go live, because we've got a lot of work to do on the data side. The data is in S4. We just need to look at how we model that data in S4 to allow us to integrate it the most effectively within UN is around modeling our asset data of our above ground assets. And this is going to be key for us as we move towards a digital twin, as we move towards IoT. So currently, we will have an above ground installation in our GIS system to say it's there and this is what it is. And you'd look at the components within SAP. What we want to do is bring them components into the UN model and look at use stuff like containment and the devices and the groupings.
to allow us to look at these assets in a geospatial way. And as I say, that'll become really, really important when we start to get into the world of, of digital twins. For us, one of the key things we have to do now as part of our license condition is to make our data, data available. We can do that now, but you know, it's like anybody, you've got to go through a process to do that. We've kind of designed the UN model and this system to allow us, we hope in some essence, just to literally press a button, make our data available, people can come and consume it. And equally, we want to be, be able to bring in different data sets as well, whether that be internal data or whether it be that external data. And all that really is for two key reasons. One, we want to improve the customer experience with an engine. Whenever a customer kind of speaks to us or we're doing work on their house or outside their house, it needs to be better. And, it, and we always want it to be better and implementing this will allow us to do that because it allows us to put data into the hands of the engineers you know, a lot easier. And also, obviously, we want to help meet the, the climate challenge to net zero. And we know data and technology is a path to that. And implementing the UN model is our ability to do that. So in terms of the procurement approach and the importance of the systems licensing and obviously data quality. So I have never, ever done a tender process that wasn't painful. Um, this one was no different. It maybe did make me cry at one point. And so kind of spoke through what we did in the business case. We kind of spoke about the different lots we went out to market with. But we didn't want to tell people what to do and to give us a price and a, a kind of proposal on that. We wanted to go to market and explain, this is the plan. We want you to come to us and tell us, you know, what are your ideas, your experiences, what are your innovative in, in, kind of solutions. And we got some really, really fantastic responses. I think to be fair, it was really good to read that people had really thought about what it is that they wanted, how they thought we should implement UN. The issue then was when we were doing the assessment, it wasn't we wasn't marking it apple versus apple because when we started asking some clarification questions, it became really, really obvious that some people were quoting for some stuff but not for other stuff. And I don't think it's fair here to kind of go into specific examples because it's just not the right thing to do. But th there was in inconsistencies where we thought of the business from a risk perspective, because you're not doing this piece of work as part of the project, we know as a business that piece of work needs to happen. So how do we do that? Are we going to get change requests out of the water here, where actually the costs then just become similar to somebody who has quoted for that? So we put a lot of time internally to review stuff because, again, people have put a lot of effort into these proposals. And what we did had to do then is go back out to the market because it won it was the right thing to do anyway from a procurement perspective. But also, as I say, people had really put some really good proposals together. So we just wanted to clarify what it is people were actually quoting for to make sure one, NGM was getting value for money, both for us and our customers. And also, you know, we wasn't going to kick that project realizing there's going to be a lot of change requests coming further down the line. And we, we got there in the end, um, and it was a really good tender process in the end. But again, a, a lot came out of it from a learning perspective. One of the things to consider, and that we had to consider, is where kind of two parties are teaming up together. And I don't think that's a problem, but, and this is more of a personal opinion, you've got to look at what are them parties bringing to the table. Because in some cases, you do have two or more parties bidding for work. and. I can speak about one special energy because they're doing the work now, but it was very clear in what both parties were bringing to the table. And how we do it is one special manage Esri, so that makes it easier for us from a, a, a risk perspective. But that relationship is key because you can tell why certain people are in the room and what, why they've been brought onto this project. And again, going back to the UN design, that has been one of the key reasons we've got a really successful UN design. So I think for me, the big learning point is if it's two or more, what are them individual people bringing to the, bringing to the table? What is it you're paying for ultimately? Licensing has gone from an absolute, I don't understand it, to blowing a party popper and being quite comfortable with it. Um, we actually dealt with this directly with Ezra, um, which for us is it's, it, the, the best way to do it. We kind of took it out of the tender, if you like. And we've currently got our current licenses and we've kind of been on a bit of an education with the team at Esri and it's been 
really good. It has been a really, really good experience where, for myself personally, I have no idea what we've got. To literally the team there explaining to us what we've got, the reasons why we've got it, and then obviously looking at what do we want in the future. So we are moving to an ELA, an enterprise license agreement. For us, it's a lot more current. It obviously reduces complexity, but more importantly, it's kind of it's a lot more flexible. We can scale it up if we need to when we start looking at doing things in in the future. And it also maximizes the value of using the services we need. And we've gone from a position of, you know, not fully understanding it to a position where, again, the team has done a great work in educating us into this is what we're going to get. This is why we've got it. This is who's going to use it. This is why they're using it. And if you do anything in the future, this is what you have to consider. And just from a control perspective and a better understanding, that was a worthwhile exercise. So I think, again, if you are looking at doing this, you know, we talk about doing upgrades and implementations to increase the quality of data, to increase the user experience, but also use it as an, maybe an experience to look at your licensing as well. And the key one, data quality. So we still behind computers, knee deep in data, ultimately going through everything, as I, as I mentioned before, where you know, we've done that data quality assessment. We, we, we've done kind of the profiling of the data to move it into the UN model. We're really now getting into the point of field by field validation, looking at what data we've got in current system, what data we're looking at, uh, at moving over. And in summary, we've kind of got to a position where we can migrate data. We know for a fact we can, which is good. Um, but we have got some kind of non-conformance within there. And it's the usual kind of stuff, really, where you've got data where you weren't expecting data. Maybe it were a process or an asset class where the data used to be maintained in GIS, but over the years, it's actually then started to be maintained in a different system. So we just need to understand what do we do there. We've also got some issues around the network connectivity. You know, one of the big benefits of UN is kind of the tracing capability. I think, honestly, that is something we will go to eventually. But I don't think it's something we'll do from day one at a really granular level. I think then some networks will be further up the chain, if you like, within the network. Because firstly, we have a system that can do that at the moment. And we've got a lot of work to do around the kind of network connectivity within the GIS system. Not just doing the work, but then validating the work. Because key business decisions will be based off this data. So again, that's something we've put on the roadmap. And that's what we'll do after when we go live. One of the big key areas is our above ground asset. We currently, as I say in GIS, we have a symbol with an above ground asset here. What we want to do now is start to look at the connectivity between them above ground assets. And that's something we do feel like we can do at our, on our high pressure network within this current project. So that again is going to be an, an improvement. So from a data quality perspective, we have as recommendations, we have as priorities. We're now just working through, well, where data cleansing is required. Do we do it in an automated way? And that will obviously be based on the volume of data and the complexity. Do we do it in a manual way? We know we have some assets in our current GIS system where the number's really, really small and there's maybe some data quality issues. Well, actually, because it isn't integrated with SAP, in this instance, actually let's go into the new, the new system and just create a manually as part of the implementation and then do the integration to that. So we'll do it on a case by case basis, but really the fundamental parts are, what do we need for a business to be able to go live the non-negotiable? And where does certain data sets form a fundamental part of the UN model? And that's really where we need to put as kind of time and, and effort in. And also, yeah, do we clean it in source or do obviously we clean it um, in the new system? So we're under no illusions around how difficult it's going to be. You know, we haven't yet done the data migration, the first data migration. We're kind of just getting ready for it. And people keep asking that question, you know, what does success look like on the first data migration? Well, after doing a lot of data migrations over the years for different systems, the one thing I've learned is, especially in them early days, is the only thing you're looking for, you know you're going to get problems, you know things are going to fail, you know things are going to fail validation. The big key question is, is it fixable? And in the early data loads, if it's fixable, you've got literally a run book of 
a defect to fix. Well, that allows every time you do a data load and the more data loads you do, the, the better you get and the more you learn, you kind of fix them as you're going along. So I think for me personally, when we do the first data load, as long as we don't get anything that isn't fixable, I'm really, really confident in the direction of travel, equally under no illusions around how, how difficult it will be. So this is where we currently are. I was kind of going to give you a bit of an update with where we are on the project, but I've covered a lot of it. We're getting ready for that first data migration. With that migration, then we can put it into the hands of the end users. We can have a system they can start looking at. I think that then will start driving out some of these use cases that maybe we haven't yet captured. It allow people to start thinking about how could their processes change? How could they become more efficient as a team or as a, an end-to-end -end process? And again, we'll continue to do data loads, then we'll go into UAT and the usual kind of project plan. And I guess just to summarize really, our experience of this so far, it's not as daunting as it might appear, I believe. You know, we were under no illusions before we started this. The experience in our case of working with one spatial and has been a positive one and they've brought a lot to the table. And I think that's a key part of why it's been such a positive thing so far. And as long as you've got the right people internally on the project and the right partners, um, I, I really do believe it, it is doable. Um, but obviously, you know, that's based on obviously people's own data quality issues and obviously going through that process. And I believe that is about it. And Jess, give me 40 minutes and I think I've done it in 37, so I'm definitely giving myself a pat on the back of that, Jess. <laughs> um, fabulous. Liam, if I can ask you to just stop sharing your screen quickly and if we can invite Phil and Craig to turn on their cameras. Um, just a reminder for anybody that um, wants to please add any questions into the question box. I have been um, jotting down the questions as they come through. Um, Liam, are you able to turn on your camera too? The this is where you find name. out it was all a lie and I know nothing about it. <laughs> Fab, thank you. So no surprises, the questions that we've had through so far are mainly for you, Liam, which is, is what we expected. Um, so I think we'll we'll kick off with, um, so how did you decide on UN as a, a target model to go to? I think there are a few reasons. I think first of all, as I said um, at the beginning, it was kind of a technology decision. Our, our um, infrastructure team definitely thought this was the right technology from an application and data, database perspective. And then from a business point of view, we really, as, as a lot of organizations, data quality is key. And we thought the UN model will allow us to improve data quality within the organization. Also from the ability to do the analytics, that's something that's key for us to move forward. And then that in, engagement piece as well. So it was definitely, infrastructure and application led but the kind of data quality analytics and user engagement was the key bit fabulous thank you and then one that's more focused around um i guess the procurement process than anything there's been a question around how you found managing three lots fun <laughs> <laughs> fun um from my point of view it it's time consuming. However, there's a lot of benefits to doing it in three lots. If you did it all as one, we would be probably working with numerous different partners. And we mentioned that before, then relationships are really, really important. We also have it be different people internally as well. So you sort of cast a, a thousand. So by breaking it down, we could be very specific in the type of partners we, we were open to come forward, how then relationships would develop potentially between them partners, and who we had to in engage internally fab okay so the, the next question is i think directed towards liam but it'd be great to get phil and craig's take on take on it too um but the question is so um you mentioned digital twins um do you see gis with utility network now becoming even more important to the management of a utility business so um liam if you if you're happy to start and then Craig and Phil, it'd be great to get your input on that as well. So 
Yes. So first of all, yes, the answer to that question is a definite yes. I think, as we know now, technology is developing and accelerating at a, a really fast pace. As we develop the network, we want to be able to utilize that within our business. We're a really interesting business, like a lot of gas networks. You're waiting for a customer to tell you something's wrong with your network, i.e. ringing in a leak or a gas escape. Well, actually, we want to be able to utilize technology so we can predict hopefully before it happens, but also when it happens, we, we straight on the case. And having IoT devices across the network would be really key for us. And then putting that into this, putting it into the UN model to be able to do the analytics. And it's not just about the digital, because the digital twin ultimately is a digital representation of an asset. Well, you've kind of got that already in your GIS system or SAP, if you want it to be really in a gray area with a definition. The ability is, is the digital twin to consume the same data as the operational software and then be able then to tweak and look at the analytics and say, if we did this, what would happen? If we did that, what would happen? And really utilize the digital twin rather than just representing it, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And um, do, do you, th just following up on that, do you think it's fair to say that um, this project and the way that people have, you know, have, have any chance to reassess has meant that actually you're looking at the best place for the data journey um, rather than necessarily being confined to systems because I know that's something that you've been doing a lot of work around as well. Yeah, what, 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 where we don't want to be, and you've got to think of the end, the, the user at the end really, you don't want them to look in a GI system to find the assets and log into a different application to find some analytics information from the IoT device and then exporting that into some analytics tool to do some proper good data science work you want it all in one place for the end user and for us this is kind of the strategic decision we've made because we believe in that system of engagement and analytics for the person at the end ultimately and what we don't want is to move away from all these different interfaces we've got now with all these replication things that just don't work it needs to be it needs to be simpler it needs to be a lot simpler Fab. And I can't help myself jumping in with a follow-up question there, but um, Craig, did you, did you have any thoughts or comments on that that you'd like to add? Yeah, definitely. I mean, one of the common things we're seeing um, across our utilities customers is this ambition to move towards a digital twin. Um, and really, the GIS or the, the network within a GIS is the foundation for a digital twin. And I think the opportunities through the utilities network, where it's a web services-based platform, that then gives you the ability for integration with ITOT, you know, bringing in that real-time information to enable organisations to be more predictive rather than reactive. But, but furthermore, you know, starting to incorporate network modelling so that you can start to do what-if scenarios. Um, and I think, Liam, you've mentioned it a number of times on the call today, this ability to have that real high level of fidelity, you know, components, assemblies, um, instead of moving away from just points and lines to represent network features, really getting down to that level of granularity so that you can trace right through the network, uh, ultimately to, to give you the right decisions. You know, where have I got a problem on the network? Tracing through who are my affected customers? Is the picture I'm getting from my operational technology uh, correct? You know, what actions do I need to take? So I think, yeah, definitely the digital twin. Um, really is a, an aspiration that can be um, baselined against utilities network. Fab and Phil, anything to add on, on that at all? Um, only really just to just to reiterate, I think we're in a you know we we all under, we increasingly understand that in complex systems, um, you know, we need to make really good informed choices uh, uh, based on sort of real data that we see and and you know in the past you know we've tended to comp compartmentalize where we store different bits of data in different systems that are very specific at doing um you know certain jobs really really well whether it's your asset management system or or your sort of gis for visualizing data but i think the 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 great thing about uh sort of the sort of GIS and, and, and move towards it till twins is that it, it's so often and it's a bit of a, a cliche phrase but actually that 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 sort of spatial element can often be the glue in 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 in, in that that ties all of this other disparate information together and it, and it harks back to that you know people seeing things visually gives them a sense of of of, of what the real world is like it's how we're used to seeing things and I think you know that's where 
you know, of, as an advocate of GIS, I would always put that, you know, as very important for, for, for a sort of digital twin and moving forward. And again, seamlessly sort of, you know, blending between whether you're looking at a CAD type view of the world, GIS, and, and those barriers are, you know, and those lines are just blurring all the time. Fabulous. So the, the next question is a two-parter, um, but the second second question is one that has come through quite a, couple, a few times on the on the questions. So um, again, um, probably one for you, Liam. Um, how long have you been working on the data migration for the first data load? Is the first part of the question. And the second part is, what does the internal team look like to support this project? So in terms of the data migration, in terms of how long, I'll kind of break that into two different activities, if that's all good. So the first part was around that kind of the design of the UN model, the kind of profiling of, of the current data. And I think to be fair, that probably took, I don't know, Phil, about eight weeks maybe. I, I don't think it was that long, um, I think around eight weeks. And that allowed us then to get a design on the UN bit. Now we get into that bit where we're doing the configuration work and obviously our, you know, the delay in the architecture has obviously held it up, but we're doing it in the one spatial bit. And I think that piece of work has been going on for about two weeks. So maybe if we can start looking at migrating data in another two weeks, you're probably looking at about a 12-week period for that kind of getting you to that first data, data migration, if I'm honest. I, I think that's probably a, a fair assessment. In terms of the internal team, I am really lucky to be surrounded by really intelligent and good people. Um, so we have a few different people. So our data science and automation lead who works in the dive team is kind of 100% on this project. Really, really fortunate there. One is an absolute expert in GIS, so that helps. And also is an expert when it comes to data science and analytics. So he's been a key person within this. We've also got our kind of expert when it comes to other applications that integrate with GIS. So we've developed over the years something called MyMaps, MyMaps Mobile, the incident app, and he's a part of the project team to allow that integration. Then we've got people within our team who are experts in SAP. So they're constantly just double checking as you're designing something, do you have the data to, to support that within SAP? So that's from a technical perspective. And then obviously there's kind of the business element so where the end users are starting to look at the business change, training, communication strategies. So it's kind of a, a, a wide range from data, business, analytics, applications. Yeah. And obviously the in, in infrastructure team as well. And uh, I guess a, a follow up that's come through on that one, Liam, um, is what applications So you mentioned my maps and my maps mobile there. Uh, what applications are you planning to implement on top of utility network? So we will continue to do what we've been doing over the past few years. So we currently use GMAP when it comes to MyMap Mobile, but we are moving over to GXM and we hopefully that will go live over the next few months. Um, we've got, we use GeoCortex for MyMap desktop ultimately. And we've got like the incident app, we've got MyDart, which I think is on LMAP, I believe. Um, so we kind of, implementing kind of different applications on top of the UN model. And that's what, what we'll continue to do. We will continue to use stuff like GeoCortex to build end user capability, especially in the field. So it's a bit of a different- just to, Oh, go on, Phil. Yeah, I think just, just to add to that, I mean, one of the great things about utility network is that it's all now service-based. So, um, you know, so that means that 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 part that functionality that, that you can get out of whether it's just you know sort of standard ArcGIS enterprise services or actual utility network services you can you can create these applications whether it's using the Esri tools or using other you know sort of third party tools that are built on top of Esri because it's all service based you you're sort of guaranteeing that 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 sort of functionality out out of it and it, and it in truth it makes decisions about what applications you're going to use uh, via the web or via mobile much much easier to take you're, you're not you're not necessarily um, you know sort of fixing yourself down a certain route because you're building off the core services that are made available from from, from utility network so again as, as, as Liam you know sort of uh, alluded to hopefully 
moving to this platform, moving to this model, then gives you a firm sort of foundation for, to, to in future, you know, bring new apps on and, and do new things without sort of always feeling that you, you can't do anything because, you know, it's going to need a big change back in, 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 in a sort of platform level. And, and it's trying to unstick yourself from that situation of, of feeling locked to something. Yeah, and I want, I one of the other key that as well. Oh, sorry, Lee, and I was just going to no, say, no, no, up on, no. on that section in your presentation where you talk about this COPS first approach, obviously that, that's key because then that's going to enable you as an organisation to leverage the, the roadmap, the significant roadmap that's coming down the line from Esri Inc. and also take advantage you know, of the ecosystem of partner solutions that's out there, you know, more, far more quicker and easier and more cost effectively than, than previously. I just I just want to say one of the things as well is as we start to consume external data, you know, doing that for us in my maps is a more efficient way because it might not be data we want to be putting into our core systems. You know, we might just want to create a viewer in my maps to consume customer data, maybe bring in some asset data and then look at that as a viewer for a certain role with an engine. And from a database management perspective, it, we feel like it's a, a lot more efficient way of doing that. Fab. Um, and, and one that um, maybe, Phil, you can take in, and uh, Liam and Craig, feel free to jump in afterwards, but how will uh, NGN manage data changes coming into the system once live, and how will they plan to maintain the quality of the uh, network integrity? So, uh, I, Phil, I can... if you want to, to run through your, almost the technical plan for that, and then, um, Liam, I know that you've got a whole strategy in mind around this piece. Yeah, a couple of angles to that. First of all, I guess the um, from the from the sort of utility network side, that that sort of data quality and integrity is sort of baked into that in, in, into that model. So the model that you define and the rules that you build around it then starts to guarantee that that then when that when data is added in or, or changed in that model, it's always adhering to these to these to these rules that you define. So in that way, you're you just sort of maintaining that integrity, and you can be sort of really rest assured then, I suppose, that, that, that you know that the edits that are happening are not are not are not are not sort of lessening that integrity in in any way. Um, the other thing, so again, as Liam alluded to here, obviously we've got integration with um, an asset management system, SAP, and um, I, th I think the you know one of the interesting things that we're going through on the project is understanding the level of that integration currently and 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 as will be on sort of day one, which you know is 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 a lot around pipes and 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 um, uh, yeah mainly to do pipes, but recognizing in in future that actually there's probably going to be a lot of more asset types and more asset types in that hierarchy that are going to start to be. Uh, visualized and, 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 and exposed in within GIS too. So it's but it, it's making sure that we're building the interface in such a way that as 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 and when the business are ready to start sort of synchronizing more of that data between SAP world, the asset management world and GIS, but then that doesn't mean oh you know we've 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 got to sort of unpick everything again and build it again so we're trying to do it in a way that actually does give that flexibility recognizing you know the, the sort of the path we're moving the path we're moving towards yeah i think that the, the key component there is is within the utility network those rules those rules that you can configure to enforce data quality which ultimately means that you know you can equip a broader set of your workforce to, to capture data you know it, it has the potential to streamline and reduce Know, quality control checks uh, so that you know as soon as that data is captured you know it can be immediately available through the system of engagement or through the system of insight to sort of really gain information on, on that network data and, and, and we're seeing a, you know a plethora of client applications spinning up now which are really targeted at different types of users uh, but in a way that makes data capture really easy okay so we, we, we're not we're not putting uh, complex applications at the fingertips of users where you know you can start to introduce data errors it's, it's really targeted and focused based upon the, the user type yeah i think just to add to that i think there's a, a few different elements from our point of view so when we implemented s4 we also then you know we built the data and information center of excellence which kind of that manages the change and we'll replicate that within the new system so we have a robust kind of change management process now within ngn 
And we've also got a lot of data quality technology, especially on the SAP side. So as that integration happens, the data has actually been checked in SAP as well to make sure it conforms. And what we're also doing by bringing together this kind of wide ranging project team, any rules that are in UN or in SAP are also being built into the mobile devices that are collecting data in the field as well. So we're getting that validation at source and potentially where it gets around it for whatever reason, because it happens, we have got then that data quality technology. Because one of the key things is you don't want people exporting data out of the system to check it's right. It's got to be automated. You've got to let technology do them checks. Otherwise, you'll never keep on top of it. Brilliant. Um, so, Liam, an, another one for you. Um, so, what are your go live criteria? Do you plan to run both systems for a while? And in hindsight, do you wish you'd been more ambitious with the scope of the project? Great question. So, the ambitious, I'll do the last one first if that's all right. I think that's a great question. Um, you can always say yes. However, we obviously didn't want to introduce too much risk to the organization and it needed to be done in a really controlled way. We all we had to educate ourselves, we had to educate our colleagues and then we had to implement a, a new system on something totally new. What I will say is, and again, not saying it because you, you guys are here, as soon as we realized actually this UN design and data migration, not easier than what we think, but actually, we, we, we've got it in a good place, we can now start to introduce some of these other things because we did have that kind of conversation around this is the non-negotiable, these would be the priority ones, priority twos, priority threes and originally that was about a roadmap for us to go live and I must admit you guys have been very, very, I guess, helpful in saying well actually if you want to bring in a few priority ones we could probably do that without bringing any risk to the project. So I think, yes, we probably could have been more ambitious in terms of the data sets that we wanted to bring in. But ultimately, it was the right thing to do from a risk perspective. And also, as we bring in more data sets, there's also a business change element to consider. So, you know, business processes could change because data has been processed in a different way. And we need to make sure that not that the business is ready. Business will always be ready to do things better. But we need to bring people on board and as part of that journey. So I think it's a great question and we've been quite fortunate, if I'm honest, that we've been able to probably get the best of both worlds there, if I'm totally honest. And apologies, Jess, what was the first part of that question? Um, let me scroll back down. Um, what, were, what are your go live requirements? Yeah, so, the th first part? so th this might seem like a really, really underwhelming comment to make, but after doing a lot of implementations in different systems, I honestly believe that you could try and get the perfect solution to be 100% ready for go live. You will never ever get there, ever. You know, in, infrastructure needs to be 100% right. Application, you can go live with some of that's 80% ready of the use cases. So some of the other stuff might be different data sets, a bit of a nice to have. So our go live criteria needs to be nobody can be in a worse position than they're in right now as a as an end user. And we already know we're going to far exceed that on so many different levels but as long as nobody's worse off than they are now and in terms of being inefficient or having to duplicate data keen in data twice i think that's a good place to be and then one you get the technology to people down quicker two you start to understand it quicker and then you can build a roadmap off that because if you're trying to aim for perfect i don't think the technology you ever get perfect now because it changes so quick Brilliant, and I'm very conscious of time. Um, so I and I know that there are, you know, <laughs> questions flying in, and we haven't been able to answer them all, unfortunately, within the the time frame. But um, what we'll do is we will we will write down some answers to these questions, and we will circulate them um, with you all, so that you can you can see the answers um, to the questions. And um, there are any in there, luckily, that I don't think that we we can answer. Um, at the moment so um we're, we will circulate those to you thank you very much for your time um as always when we follow we follow up with the um answers to these questions um any feedback on the next webinar that you'd like to see from one spatial and as for uk and northern gas networks if they are kind enough to attend another one um please do let us know um we want to do everything we can to help you on on this journey and, and provide you with all the information that you need the good the bad and the ugly um so please please do fire in those questions um and thank you very much for your time
Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Liam. Great presentation. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.